We have previously determined the equation here of the uniform flow and we will now see how to calculate the water depth in such a type of flow or the discharge and discuss some particular cases. Let's start with the discharge. By definition, it is the product of the flow area and the flow velocity. So, using the Manning equation, the discharge is expressed like this. If the channel cross-section A, the water depth H, the bed slope and the friction coefficient are known, the discharge can be easily calculated. We will develop now this calculation for a trapezoidal cross-section as illustrated here. Using the definition of the hydraulic radius, the expression can be rewritten like this. Then, for the trapezoidal cross-section, A and P can be expressed as functions of the water depth H, the width at the bottom level L, and the bank slope defined by small p as illustrated here. So, finally, the discharge can be expressed directly as a function of these parameters by incorporating equations 3 and 4 into equation 2. In general, the bed slope S0 is known, as well as the slope of the banks and the friction coefficient. So, applying the uniform flow equations to the trapezoidal channel illustrated here, we can easily calculate the discharge as a function of the depth that is called the uniform depth and denoted HU. A more difficult problem is to calculate the depth H at which the uniform flow will establish itself for a given discharge, knowing the geometric details of the channel. To do this, we need to isolate H from equation 5, which is impossible as H appears here, here and here with different exponents. So, we rewrite this equation by isolating the highest power of H. Equation 6 can now then only be solved by iterations. An example is given here for the trapezoidal channel that is illustrated. The discharge is 400 cubic meter per second, and we look for the corresponding water depth. A first guess of the uniform depth is introduced in the right-hand side here of the equation, and the result is calculated. The result is the calculated value indicated here in the right column of the table. Then we introduce this value again in the equation. We find a new value and we see that the iterations rapidly converge towards the solution that is slightly above 4 meter. Using the same example, we can represent the evolution of the uniform depth as a function of the discharge or as a function of the bed slope. Here, we see that the flow depth decreases as the bed slope increases. We can also observe that the uniform depth tends to infinity when the bed slope approaches zero. This means that the uniform depth does not exist in a horizontal channel. This is logical. We have seen that the uniform flow is the result of an equilibrium between the gravitational acceleration of the flow due to the bed slope and the friction forces. So if there is no slope, there is no acceleration and no uniform flow. However, other types of flow, non-uniform, exist on horizontal beds, as we will see later. Finally, we can see here the evolution of the uniform depth as a function of the friction coefficient. For higher friction coefficients, the uniform depth will be larger in order to maintain a constant discharge as the velocity will decrease due to the friction. Indeed, a larger quantity of ma or mass of water is required to counterbalance the increased friction force. Compound channels or rivers with active floodplains deserve a particular attention. The minor bed here is the part of the river where water flows even in the dry season. The floodplains are covered by water only for high discharges or in flood conditions. So in general, the roughness coefficient is different in the minor bed and in the floodplains, 
where vegetation can grow between floods. Two different methods can be applied to calculate a uniform flow in such a compound channel. We first consider the single channel method, where the velocity is assumed to be constant all over the cross section. So we have the same cross section average velocity here all over the section. This leads to the calculation of the discharge with the classical form here of the Manning equation. And if the roughness of the different parts of the cross sections are different, for example, a different value on the floodplains and in the minor bed, an equivalent Manning coefficient can be calculated as we have seen for a heterogeneous cross section. In the second method, the divided channel method, the cross section is divided in three parts, here, 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 and the discharge is just the sum of the discharges over each subsection. This leads to this equation for the discharge, where k is the conveyance, k that represents this factor here. So in this expression, the wetted area and the wetted perimeter are calculated as follows. For example, for subsection 1 here, the wetted area is the green area, and P1 consists of the red part only. The separation between subsection 1 and 2 is considered as frictionless and does not, is not accounted for in the wetted perimeter. A comparison of these two methods with experimental measurements of the water level in a compound channel for a different discharges shows that none of these two methods is able to represent the flow behavior in a completely satisfactory way. The single channel method overestimates the total friction, while the divided channel method underestimates it. In the reality, the velocity distribution over the cross section is far from being uniform, as illustrated here. We have a faster flow in the minor bed and a slower flow on the floodplains. So momentum exchanges will occur at the interface between the minor bed, the fast flow of the minor bed, and the slow flow in the floodplains. These exchanges lead to additional head losses that will result in a higher water level than the one predicted by the divided channel method. So here, the red curve was obtained using the exchange discharge model that was developed specifically for compound channels and accounts for the momentum exchanges in a better way. The development of this method is, however, far beyond the scope of this course. So this leads us to have a closer look at the velocity distribution in a cross section. Indeed, we have assumed a constant velocity but we have just seen that it is not always the case. And in fact, in the reality, due to the friction on the walls, lateral walls or the bed, where um, a boundary, we have a boundary layer that will take place. For example, if we look at the velocity distribution along the water depth here, we can observe that the average velocity v is about 90-92% of the surface velocity vs here, and that it is close to zero at the bed. The non-uniformity of the velocity distribution can have an impact on flow calculations. This impact is evaluated using these correction coefficients. Alpha is a Coriolis coefficient used in the Bernoulli equation for the kinetic energy term, and beta is the Boussinesque coefficient used in momentum equations. Some typical values of these coefficients are indicated in the table. We see that for regular channels, the values are close to 1, so in, in practice these coefficients will often be omitted when the assumption is valid, of course. Finally, a typical application of uniform flow is the design of irrigation channels. Indeed, these channels are prismatic, often trapezoidal, they have a constant slope, and hence the assumptions of the uniform flow are verified. 
except, of course, in the non-prismatic reaches, for example, in the widening at the foreground here of the photograph. In general, the bed material is known, and thus also the bank slope. The bed slope is fixed by the general layout of the system, and the manning coefficient n is thus also known as the material of the channel is known. For example, it can be concrete or just earth. So the dimensions to be determined are the bottom width l and the depth h, with the aim of maximizing the discharge. From equation 1, we see that to maximize the discharge, we need to maximize the wetted area and minimize the wetted perimeter P, as here. So we look for the values of L and H that will fulfill these conditions. This can be achieved by taking the derivatives of A and P with respect to DL and DH. For example, if we fix the wetted perimeter, then dp is equal to zero, and we maximize the wetted area, which implies that dA is equal to zero. This is system 4 that can be solved to find the link between H and L that will maximize the discharge. This link is expressed by equation 5. That can be rewritten to obtain the condition 6. This condition expresses the equality between these two green lines. And these two green lines define an isocellus triangle OCD. The aids of this triangle OK and FC have just the same length. That is equal, as we see from Fc, that are, that is equal to the water depth H. So this means that the optimal trapezoidal cross-section is constructed around the half circle of radius H. The hydraulic radius of this optimal cross-section can be calculated using the definitions of A and P in equations here 2 and 3, and the condition 6 to replace L. The result is found to be H divided by 2. Here is an example of calculation. We look for the optimal cross-section to convey a discharge of 10 cubic meter per second, with these values here of the bed slope, um, the bank slope, and the friction coefficient. In the expression for the discharge uh, here, we have replaced L using the relation 6 that we just obtained and as is re recalled here. We can solve this equation to find H, that is 1.46 meter. And from there, we can obtain the other dimensions of the cross section. L, that is 2.28 meter, and the, the cross section. We see that, in fact, the depth is relatively large compared to the width at the bottom. So we have a, a deep cross-section with this um, optimal procedure. Here we see different examples where the irrigation channels can have a trapezoidal shape, a rectangular one, or a semicircular one. However, it must be pointed out, as just observed, that the theoretical results lead to deep cross-sections that are more expensive to dig and may induce bank stability issues. So in practice, the cross-section will often be wider and shallower. And with this, we finish this lesson about uniform flow. See you for the next lesson 